Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wanda Meyer Price, and on behalf of the Cannon Beach Library and the Northwest Authors Speaker Series, I welcome everyone who is here today, both in the library and online. And a very big welcome uh, to writer, author, and teacher Marianne Monson who will present to us her most recent work of historical fiction, The Opera Sisters. The Opera Sisters is based on a true story about two British sisters, which you don't normally write about. It's mostly US frontiers yes. women. Yes. Uh, two British sisters, Ida and Louise Cook, who were passionate about music, especially opera, and how they use their love of opera to help Jewish refugees escape from Nazi territory in the run up to World War II. Ida and Louise Cook were two rather obscure but remarkable women. And Marianne is known for unearthing remarkable stories about remarkable women through her writing. For example, the nonfiction Frontier Grit from 2016 tell stories of 12 daring pioneer women. Women of the Blue and Gray from 2018 is a collection of biographical sketches of women who were medics, cross-dressing soldiers, I guess, <laughs> um, activists and spies during the Civil War. And her work, another work of historical fiction, Her Quiet Revolution, which we don't have up here, mm -hmm. Um, is about the frontier doctor and women's rights advocate, Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon, who as a Democrat bested her Republican husband <laughs> in the 1896 elections in Utah, becoming the very first female state senator elected in the United States. Wow. The Opera Sisters has been nominated for a Whitney Award through the Church of Latter-day Saints, and Frontier Grit was nominated for the American Library Association's Amelia Bloomer Award, which recognizes books that affirm positive roles for girls and women. Marianne holds an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts and a master's in English pedagogy from Pacific University. She has taught writing at Portland Community College, Clatsop Community College, Brigham Young University, Hawaii, lucky you, uh, <laughs> and Texas State University. She has published 12 books for children and adults with an emphasis on women's history in the frontier era. She's a regular contributor to Rain Magazine, Hip Fish, and Coast Weekend, and is founder and president of the literary nonprofit Writers Guild. She also organizes and guides small group art and writing retreats in select foreign locations. Her next retreat is in Cambodia at the end of this year, just in case you're interested. <laughs> when she's not traveling, Marianne divides her time between San Marcos, Texas, and Astoria, Oregon. Without further ado, let's welcome Marianne Monson to our Northwest Author Speaker Series. And please hold your questions until after the presentation and kindly silence your phones. Thank you so much, Fonda, and thank you to the Cannon Beach Library. It's really a pleasure to be here. I always um, am very happy to have a reason to come down here to Cannon Beach, which uh, has been a favorite spot of mine for a very long time. So thank you all for coming today. It's really a pleasure to have you here. And it's great to be part of, uh, of the Northwest Authors Series. This town is a really wonderful supporter of the literary arts, which I really appreciate. So, so we're gonna talk about the Opera Sisters. I'm gonna make sure I know, do I go up or down to go? Down. Down to advance. Okay, wonderful. So this is my most recent book, The Opera Sisters, and uh, Wanda mentioned uh, Frontier Grit and Women of the Blue and Gray as well. And I do have a book about 
fairies. But anyway, that's a, <laughs> <laughs> a little off subject for me. But um, yeah, I, I can show you later if you want to see a copy of that. That was actually my very first put, book published in um, the year 2000, a long time ago. I was an editor at a publishing house in Portland. And so they ended up publishing my first book. So. Yeah, so as Wanda mentioned, the Opera Sisters is a little different from what I normally write. Also, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, yes. okay, I will try and project, just raise your hand if you if you can't, and I'll, I'll try and speak up. But yeah, so I mostly write about um, the American history, I write women's history for the most part when I'm not writing about fairies, but, <laughs> and, um, and mostly uh, in the American West. And I, I really, uh, in 2015, my editor asked me, she said, I, I think you should write a book about pioneer women. And I was like, I don't know, do we really need another book about pioneer women? <laughs> and so I thought about it, like how I could take my own, you know, approach to it in a way that would be interesting. And that I didn't feel like had been done before. And I thought, I just really kind of dug into what does it mean to be a pioneer? You know, like, what do we mean by that? Like there's so, in the in the US, it's really connected to the idea of westward expansionism and to this like white colonialism, but what does it really mean, you know? Um, and I was like, it actually just means to go into a place that you and your people have never been, you know, like you're, your group of people that you hang out with and talk to. That's what it really means. And I thought if we redefine it um, in that way, like then it allows us to really broaden it. So Mexican American women traveling north would be pioneers, right? Polynesian women traveling east would be pioneers, right? So so I decided to approach it in that way. And it made it much more interesting to me. And so that's the book that um, kind of set me on, on this journey of writing women's stories. And uh, and I've been doing it ever since. And it's really such a privilege. I just, I love to, I love the research. I love the presentation. I love sharing stories of incredible women with people um, because most of us didn't grow up with enough of them you know and I think the last few years has has been you know starting it in 2015 I was a little bit ahead of the curve and I feel lucky that way um but there's been so much remarkable research that has kind of brought to life so many women's stories since since I wrote Frontier Grit and that just makes me super happy um but uh Another piece of my own background that really came to play in the Opera Sisters is that I was lucky enough to have a wonderful grandfather, Dalcy Elred, who <laughs> you can see here is reading me stories um, when I was, I think, two. <laughs> So he was a very wonderful gentleman. He was an architect and he also um, had a wood shop. He would let me play in and would like work uh, with his tools and make lots of a mess, I'm sure. What I didn't appreciate enough when I was little was that he also was a World War II hero. So he fought in the 10th Mountain Division in World War II, which was a group of specialized um, specialty trained Alpine fighters. So they trained at Camp Hale in Colorado, and then they were sent over to fight in the Italian Alps. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was instrumental in the assault on Mount Belvedere, which if you know anything about the Italian theater, that was a really a key turning point in the, in the war in that area. So essentially those men, they had uh, mules, they had skis, they had guns, and they would climb up the mountains. And I can't imagine how, um, grueling and intense that some of that fighting was. Um, so he didn't, like most veterans, he hardly talked about it very rarely. Um, and uh, and I think that was because he never wanted me to think of him as a soldier. I think he wanted me to think of him as, you know, a grandpa who l let me play in his wood shop. <laughs> but luckily he also wrote a lot of letters to my grandmother during the war. And um, my grandmother was at home and she was actually working, inspecting machine gun uh, ammunition in a 
Remington Arms Factory. So she was working on, on the uh, war effort from the US side. So, so both of them were really deeply impacted by the war. And I grew up with stories. Um, and I also was very fortunate to have my grandfather's letters. And I also was very lucky that his wife uh, was a talker, was a writer, was an avid story keeper. So she just collected all of his letters. She collected all of his stories. And uh, so I was able, after he passed mostly, because he passed away when I was 18. Um, so I was able to go back and understand what he had done and start to recreate some of his, uh, his experiences as I got more interested in history and research myself. So I knew I wanted to write about World War II at one point, but it is outside the scope of what I mostly write about. And also, I mean, how many of you have read like at least a dozen novels set during World War II? <laughs> it's, it's really um, abundant literature, right? And uh, it's just, it's a little bit intimidating to think about trying to say something new on the subject. It seems to some extent that almost everything on the subject has been said, right? So I knew I needed to find the right story. And I also think a couple of my experiences in college really came together in this book because I kind of on a whim, honestly, ended up spending six months in Jerusalem on study abroad. And I was studying Hebrew and Near Eastern studies and, um, and spent a lot of time, you know, at uh, working with a Jewish professor and uh, delved into the Holocaust. So you know, there was that. And then I also did a study abroad in London. So those two study abroads really <laughs> converged in this book in an interesting way that I never anticipated. But um, but when I was studying in London, I really got to learn a bit about World War II from their perspective. Of course, it was quite a different experience uh, being on the other side of, of the Atlantic. And um, became completely enamored with Churchill, which only deepened with this project. But anyway, definitely gained enough appreciation of British English to understand that writing a book in British English is not the same language as writing in American English. So um, anyway, yeah. So I feel like all of these different experiences earlier in my life came together in this book. So the World War II story that I was looking for, I found, um, and this was around 2018, so it was right after Women of the Blue and Gray had come out. My editor sent me an article, it was a magazine article, about two sisters, Ida and Louise Cook. And she said, I think this story would make a really great novel. And I read it and I was like, oh, you are right. Like, it would make an incredible novel. And there was no, at that point, there were no books that had ever been written about Ida and Louise Cook. Um, there, there have been some articles and Ida is actually, was actually a prolific writer herself. She wrote over 120 romance novels. <laughs> <laughs> Under the pseudonym Mary Burchell, she was very prolific. And um, so, yes, she was kind of the Danielle Steele of her day. <laughs> so she published in the UK version of Harlequin, essentially. So, but before that, she and her sister were just work, working class um, women. They were copy typists earning three pounds a week. They lived with their parents um, pretty, their whole lives, essentially. Uh, and so they lived a very ordinary working class existence. You know, they were born in Sunderland, which is up near the border of Scotland. So it's Northern England. And, uh, but then they spent most of their adult lives in London. So the sisters, uh, they were inseparable. They were best friends, which I, that was one thing that really drew me to the story was I just thought this relationship between these two sisters is so sweet. And it actually reminded me a lot of my great aunt and my great grandmother who were also best friends and lived across the street from each other and about the same era. And so actually that's who I dedicated the, the book to. Um, it says, for Alice and Afton, two inseparable sisters who lived through the great wars. So that's who they were, yeah. And, they're, and that's really who I based the friendship off of because I was fortunate enough to have like seen the interactions between those two sisters and how, and, I, and that was how I imagined Ida and Louise being too. 
So the two sisters fell in love with opera and they fall in love with it kind of the way that kids now would fall in love with Taylor Swift. Like they were fangirls, you know, <laughs> they didn't just like opera, like in a highbrow way, like they bought a camera and stalked, uh, stalked the singers to get pictures of them. <laughs> they like hang out and see if they could get glimpses of them could talk to them. And they bought the very cheapest seats in the gallery at Covent Garden. They would walk to work to save money on bus fare so they could save up for those cheap seats in the in the galleries. So, you know, they were sitting way up here <laughs> at the back. But still living in London, getting cheap seats, like that's still a great place to be if you're into any art form, actually. In fact, that was me as a student on London Study Abroad was sitting in the cheap student seats at the back. You still get to hear. So so um, they also were happened to kind of hit the golden age of opera. So Amelita Galli Curci was an Italian soprano, and she's one of the very first that they heard at Covent Garden. They're just smitten with it. And like I said, followed them around, kind of starstruck. Their fangirling really paid off <laughs> because I guess uh, the opera stars didn't have a ton of like devoted fans like that. And also Ida and Louise got super interested in like learning everything about opera so they could really talk the language, you know. And um, it's interesting to me because there was a huge class difference here, right? And yet they became personal friends with Rosa Ponzel, Viorica Ursula, Clemens Krauss, and Ezio Pinza, um, as, as well as Amelita Gallicurci. So really, like so many of the famous opera stars of their day, they, be they became personal friends with, which is kind of amazing to me. But I think it was sheer enthusiasm. Also, Ida was just like a completely romantic, I mean, she's a romantic novelist, right? <laughs> and it was kind of hard to resist her enthusiasm. So um, it's hard to, to not everybody was Ida's friend she was just everybody's friend this is um these are <laughs> they couldn't afford like ready-made clothes so they would get patterns and then and they would go find cheap fabric and then Ida would sew their clothes they would wear to the opera <laughs> so these are their handmade clothes that Ida made <laughs> for their for their um for their opera costumes so I just also really fell in love with like just how disarming they both were. You know, they're just like both so down to earth and sort of adorable. <laughs> <laughs> they got in uh, into opera at a rather interesting time though. So, um, you know, uh, I did, before doing this research, I actually was not aware that Adolf Hitler was also a huge opera fan. Are any of you aware of that? <laughs> Yeah, and opera actually paid, played a very significant role within the Third Reich. So um, I think it's more commonly known that uh, that Hitler and the Nazis used art as propaganda, right? And they had their degenerate art list, so they would shut down the art and uh, they didn't like, and they would burn books, for instance. So they had a very strong history of using some arts as propaganda and then disparaging others that, that, that disagreed with them politically or in some other way. But so actually one of the overture, the overture from Rienzi, from the Wagner opera Rienzi, was played at every Nazi rally. Ever. It was like the Nazi theme song, and that, that's an opera overture. So um, Hitler loved opera. He was crazy about it, and he actually talks about it in Mein Kampf, which I read for for research for this book. <laughs> I've never read it before, um, but yeah, he talks he talks quite a bit about like his first experience with opera and how deeply it moved him. He loved the pageantry of it. He loved the splendor of it. Right? You can. I mean, he loved the old opera houses. He felt like it represented Germany's high art form, right? And um, and he loved having <laughs> a lot of the most popular operas reinterpreted with Nazi symbology and figures that sort of seemed like they might be him. So he really loved that. <laughs> yeah, it was like kind of perfect for the narcissist that he was, right? 
So the thing that was so brilliant and, and completely accidental on the part of the sisters is that by becoming opera fanatics at the time they did and becoming deeply knowledgeable about the composers and becoming connected with these top opera singers, they actually were setting themselves up to be the perfect, um, the perfect, what, double cover agents, I guess. Yeah, like they were, a they were able to be identifying themselves as opera lovers in Hitler's Germany was to align themselves with the elites. It was to align themselves with the Nazi regime, essentially. And so as they started becoming aware of the situation in Europe, oh, sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to stop this just yeah, for one second fine. and I'm going to put the live stream back. Okay. Up. Facebook took us down. Oh no! For um, inappropriate. Inappropriate. Oh, I'm gonna I don't think there's too many other <laughs> inappropriate yeah. pictures. Wow. It's actually not the first time that has happened. Really? Yeah. You yeah. and your scandalous authors. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing a lot. <laughs> questionable content. Is it recording still or not? It's still recording. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So well, I'll still I'll talk. Have that okay. Yeah. So anyway, it really set them up to be um able to travel within the nazi territory without suspicion because they had a perfect cover right if somebody asked them why are you here well they knew clemens kraus who was one of hitler's favorite opera directors they knew him personally and and they would travel to see his operas they could tell you all about it they could tell you all the cast they could tell you the history of it they could just talk your ear off so it was a great cover because it was real they just had to pretend to be themselves right which is the, always the best cover, actually. <laughs> so, okay, let's get away from the questionable image. <laughs> get shut down again. So, as I mentioned, uh, Ida, um, Ida really loved romance novels, and even though she was a copy typist by day, she was always writing little things on the side. She she got published first uh, in Mavs magazine, so she got she started writing little articles for them. And then pretty soon she started writing serial fiction and it became really popular. And then um, the, the British equivalent of Harlequin picked up her novels and started publishing them. So she started making money, like really decent money. And uh, for the first time, you know, this family had access to these resources and tried to figure out what to do with it. Uh, but pretty quickly they decided to put it to very good use um funding their own underground railroad essentially so this is the austrian anschluss in march 1938 when um you know in germany the as the nazis come to power like uh it's a very slow erosion of rights for the jewish people and the other targeted groups the roma and the homosexuals um uh and yeah people who were differently abled and houseless people as well targeted. So it's a slow erosion of rights with um, in Germany. In Austria, it falls all at once. It's uh, March 1938 and people who, you know, have been Austrian for generations, who fought in World War I for Austria, uh, who feel like they're safe, immediately they are targeted by their neighbors. And the sisters are very aware of this because they have friends in this area and they're connected. Um, and they actually happen, Ida and Louise happen to be over there and they see Polish Jews being rounded up for transport. So they become aware of this and they essentially um, start working this underground network way before the rest of the world is really aware. I mean, certainly by the Anschluss, then you get to Kristallnacht and now, now everybody's paying attention, right? But in the year, they've already been working um, to help families that are connected with their opera networks uh, escape and come to England in many cases, and also to continue on to America. And so they do this by obtaining sponsors. They, the British government was requiring 
sponsors for people. And it's kind of a big deal. You have to say that you will be financially responsible for a stranger you have never met for the foreseeable future. Like, <laughs> so uh, there's, that's pretty hard to get a lot of people to sign up for that, right? Um, after Crystal knocked, it gets easier because people are a lot more aware of what's going on. But uh, Ida is incredibly persuasive and she starts persuading all of her friends and family, everyone she knows to sign up for these guarantees. So additionally, they they will they develop the system with Clemens Krauss and Bjorka or Salik, where they will go in one border crossing, like they will fly down to Croydon, for instance, and they'll go in wearing their normal clothes. And then they'll meet up with refugees trying to escape. And they will go out a different border, usually up by Amsterdam, so Northern Germany, um, wearing all sorts of jewels and having jewels in their bags and uh, fur coats. They'll pick out the labels, they'll sew in the labels of um, British furriers, so it won't raise suspicion. And so they smuggle out these belongings because one of the things that the Nazi, Nazi regime is doing is uh, inventorying all of the property of Jewish people and um, and will not allow them to leave with it. So essentially they're confiscating all this wealth from Jewish families, they're stealing it all. And they um, are essentially not letting them leave with it. And then guess what? None of the surrounding countries want to allow these immigrants to come in and they have no resources, right? So, so it, it's this double bind and Ida and Louise find create this system that is essentially um, circumventing it, so. So uh, they work feverishly trying to get people out until the blitz, uh, sorry, until the war begins. And, um, and after the war begins between Germany and England, they are not able to get word anymore about their cases. Um, and so it goes into the, they go into this period that is incredibly difficult for both of them because they're not able to get information about what happened to the many, many families that they're attempting to help. The sisters are in London during the Blitz. And at one point their house is, I'm gonna back up. At one point that their house is bombed. Um, and uh, so anyway, so what I find remarkable about this story is I had heard stories, I think we have all heard stories about people who got involved attempting to help uh, Jewish people escape, right? Um, specifically, you know, most most famously, uh, we have, what is the movie? Schindler. Yes, Schindler's List, thank you, with Oscar Schindler, yeah. So that's, you know, the most famous example. But most of the people that did that, they were wealthy and they were male. Like that's just really most of the stories that we have. What really struck me about Ida and Louise's story is that they were female, they were women who never got married, you know, and they also were working class sisters. I mean, they had Ida's money, so that helped, you know, although by the time the war breaks out, they, Ida has committed all of her writing money and then some. She's gone into debt. She's leveraged her future writing in order to continue to fund this, this underground operation that they've run. So, um, so my book is the very first book that is written about them. The second one came out a week after mine. <laughs> and it's by Isabel Vincent. And she's an investigative journalist. And it's nonfiction. So mine's fiction, hers is nonfiction. So um, I knew her book was coming. I was actually hoping it was going to come out before mine so I could read it <laughs> and see what she dug up, you know, because, um, yeah. But anyway, so we'll come. Um, so, but once I, when I, when it did come out and I read it a week after mine came out, I was so curious because a lot of people had speculated, including myself, like, this is kind of a big undertaking to just, you know, decide to go in and then you just start throwing your entire, like all the money you've ever made, which is way more than you, your family's ever had before at this project, right? So a lot of people have speculated that the British government must have been helping or funding, that they, they were basically spies for the government. So Isabel investigated it. I was researching it during COVID, you know, so it became really challenging to, um, to get access. 
I, I couldn't tell. I was like on the fence about it, but I couldn't find any evidence. Anyway, she concluded at the end of her investigation, no, they, they weren't. They, they were not working with the British government in any formal capacity. They really did just start their own underground operation and finance it all themselves. <laughs> so, so that was what part, part of what made the story just so incredible to me. So I started working on this book, um, in 2018, but seriously working on it in 2019. Uh, and then Her Quiet Revolution came out February 2020, which was the year that was supposed to be remembered for the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the US. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what anyone is going to remember about it <laughs> when they think of February 2020. But um, so as I got into it, just as I was getting into it, you know, everything shut down. I always do on location research for my books. Uh, I think fiction particularly, like it's really hard to do any sort of online archival research. Like it's not gonna tell you what the air smells like, you know, <laughs> you just need those kind of tactile um, details. So anyway, it became really clear in, in 2020 that, um, that the, the archives that I needed were gonna be closed and that it was very unlikely I was going to be getting over there. So anyway, thinking that nothing was ever going to come of it, my editor encouraged me, let's just try, let's reach out to the embassies over there and see what we can, we can get a hold of. So we explained the project, we showed them what we were doing and where we needed to go. And three weeks before I had a ticket to go that I assumed was not gonna be used, um, they granted me permission, special permission <laughs> to enter the EU uh, in September of 2020. Mm -hmm. So I was like the only American over there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in September, 2020. And it was, it just, and I, I really think like Ida Cook is responsible for this. Cause if you know her, she's like the most optimistic person and everything just always worked out for her. <laughs> so it was just so funny. I just said it had to have been her like pulling some strings, you know? Cause as it was, you know, you, I'm sure you all remember spring 2020, you know, everything shut down summer opened up and people were like, maybe it's going to get better, right? So some public performances started going again. I'm talking about opera in Europe specifically. That's what I wanted to get over there to see. So, um, so something started opening up again, right? So it stayed open through September, October, and then everybody's like, nope, the numbers started spiking again. So they shut everything back down. So I just happened to be over there in this little window of time when I could go see opera in Vienna and in Munich, you know, which was basically this small little window that was the only time it was gonna happen within, you know, like a two, three year stretch. So I was able to go to Munich and I saw Mignon at the Bavarian State Opera House, which is um, an opera house I wrote about in the book and set a scene there. Uh, I went to the Dachau concentration camp, which is just outside of Munich, and there was no direct scene, but I just really wanted to, you know, write about the, the Holocaust and those events <laughs> with a firm grasp of, you know, of, of the events that happened there. I went to Salzburg, Austria, where the sisters go, and there are scenes in the novel set there because they went to an opera festival there in Salzburg. And then I went over to Vienna and um, and went to the Mil Museum of Military History in Vienna that has one of the largest collections of World War II uh, materials and material cultural history in the world. So that was really amazing to go there. And then I went to the Vienna State Opera House, the Wienstatzer Opera. And I saw Placido Domingo sing, oh. yeah, in Simone Bocanegra. So, yeah, it was incredible. We were sitting, you know, there were alternating seats. So, and we all we had masks on, um, but we were there having opera, you know, <laughs> September 2020. So it was incredible. And again, it, I mean, it's not obviously it's very different than what Ida was doing, but the uncertainty and and the fear, like in a way, was 
kind of perfect because I think it recreated to some extent, you know, the feelings that those sisters had when they were traveling in and out, you know, um, from, from London to the continent and opera was always a part of their trips. So, because that was their cover. <laughs> so they had to go to the opera. Um, I then went up to Edinburgh and went south and visited the, their homes, the, the home where they were born in Sunderland. And this plaque was put up on their street not so long ago. I knocked on the door and the woman who owns their house today was so kind and let this American author in to go see uh, the house that they were born in, which you know I was able to, to write about in some of the earlier scenes in the novel. And this is London. And then I went down to London um, and London had put up these signs all over town it's like a sweet idea you know in the middle of the pandemic there's so much uncertainty it's nice to see it's nice to see signs like that it was a very interesting time to be there it, there were no americans so it was really kind of heavenly there's no tourists <laughs> i had it all to myself um yeah and i was also able to visit the churchill war rooms and do some research and ended up church involving Churchill in a lot of the scenes because I, I absolutely think that his uh his really the rhetoric the writing that he did with his speeches around World War II I personally believe they completely changed the outcome of that war I think it would have been a different war without Churchill so um with possibly a different outcome so yeah I became a very big Churchill fan and really enjoyed that um, <laughs> I had to visit platform <laughs> nine and three quarters for my Harry <laughs> Potter fan children, <laughs> and there was no line. <laughs> I've heard there's a fairly long line most of the time. And then this is 27 Morella Road in London, and that's where the sisters lived with their parents most of their adult life, and they, they lived there till they died. So um, again, knocked on the door, and this woman's <laughs> total stranger was so nice, and uh, we corresponded long afterwards, too, and by email, so just so incredibly helpful. So, you know, I got the kinds of details that you just can't find on the internet, you can't make up or it would be a shame to make them up if they exist out there in the world you know so i came home and um and i thought i guess i need to write this book <laughs> because really before then it had gotten hard it had just gotten to the point where i just felt like i'm not sure this is ever going to happen you know it just was so discouraging to keep finding all of these but anyway, then Ida pulled all of her strings and so <laughs> I thought, okay, I guess I better write this book since you did your part, Ida. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is a picture, um, Ida and Louise, they worked to, att they attempted to save hundreds of Jewish families um, and they successfully got out 29. So, but after so many hours and hours and hours of work with red tape and bureaucracy, and a dear friend of mine recently read this book and he fought in Afghanistan and has been trying to help Afghan refugees get out. And he actually had to stop reading the book at one point and he went back to it and he finished it, but it, he just said it, it was hard. And he said, I feel like we haven't learned anything. You know, he just related so much to Ida's work and how people's lives are hanging on these bureaucratic red tape details, you know. So I, the book ended up having a lot of surprising relevance to me, especially with the invasion of Ukraine. Just as I was sending the book to press, I just was like, this is so horribly relevant. <laughs> so yeah, but the, but they stayed friends with many of the people they had helped for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. It was just this like really deep bond and connection with them that would never end. One of the people that they saved was Elsa Meyer Leesman. And Elsa had an incredible knowledge of opera. Um, and this is a quote from Prince Charles. Elsa settled in London and she she started an opera studio there in London. And one, one of her pupils was Prince Charles. <laughs> so, and, and she taught him about opera. So uh, Charles said her descriptions and explanations of the background to various operas, particularly those of Wagner, made the whole difference to my subsequent enjoyment of the actual performance and transformed the experience. So. 
the sisters were honored by Yad Vashem as Righteous Among the Nations in 1964. They were honored as British heroes of the Holocaust in 2010. And uh, the prime minister, speaking of the sisters in Auschwitz, said they were shining beacons of hope in the midst of terrible evil because they were prepared to take a stand against prejudice, hatred, and intolerance. We pay tribute to them for the inspiration they provide now and for future generations to come. So I do want to mention that I think when we're telling stories of the rescuers, it's really important that we put it in context because I think it's easy for all of us to say like, that's what I would have done if I'd been there, you know? And I know we all wanna believe that for really good reasons, <laughs> but it's really sobering when you look at the statistics of the actual number of people who helped. You know, I think sometimes it, we don't have an accurate perception because we tell those stories now, but the vast majority of people who lived through that time, they bought into Nazi propaganda, which was really persuasive, you know? Or they were scared into submission because people around them were losing their lives, right? And so the very, very few people who got involved in rescue work at like Ida and Louise did, the very small, small minority. Um, so I think that their story is one that is remarkable, but is just also really important to keep in, in context, right, historically. But even more reason to tell their story. So they uh, they really, like I said, they kept in contact with the, many of the people they had helped for the rest of their lives. And they also stayed involved with refugee work. And they also stayed involved with opera. So they're just delightful, wonderful sisters. And Ida passed a few years before Louise and their niece said that really when Ida past Louise was was not there anymore either like she just had no more will to live they were that deeply bonded with each other you know they're just best friends from beginning to end so that is some of their story so I hope you may you might check it out but I'm happy to answer questions and and then sign some books so would you consider reading a passage oh yeah I'd love to sure yeah and then I'll answer more questions. How about that? <laughs> so the way that I wrote it, I wanted to show the sister stories. And then I also wanted to show um, the historical context, like outside of what the sisters themselves would know. So I kind of wrote these prose poems to capture the historical context. And, uh, and then I have the narrative with the sisters. Um, so I might just read the first prose poem that gives you some historical context. Uh, and I do want to mention too, that it is written in British English and I am obviously not British and I'm not going to fake an accent for you <laughs> while I read it. But the woman who does the audiobook on Audible, she is British and she's an award-winning British voice actress. She does all the accents beautifully. And so anyway, just a, a shout out to the audio book. <laughs> so I like reading the book, but I, I do think she does it better than I do. <laughs> so. Okay, so one trillion marks, Munich 1923. A long horn blared through the factory corridor, signaling the morning break. Expectant workers streamed into the courtyard, wiping sweat from their faces. Through the front gates rumbled a lorry filled with stacks of bound paper fluttering in the morning breeze. When the lorry halted with a mechanical grunt, the chief cashier and his assistant climbed onto its bed. Schultz, the cashier called, and a man stepped out of line, cap pulled low across his brow. The assistant gathered a bundle of notes, heavy as a brick, and tossed it down to the waiting man who grabbed it, shoved it into his knapsack, and turned on his heel, sprinting in the direction of the street. Oh, the cashier called next, talking, tossing down a bundle so large the man below could scarcely carry it. Newman. The ritual repeated itself. Each man raced to the street and barreled into shops, begging to exchange his stack of money for a bit of potatoes, a lump of coal, a bo small bottle of paraffin. Prices rose by the hour. Restaurants didn't bother printing menus. By the time the bill arrived, the price had changed. American visitors couldn't spend their money because no German had marks enough to exchange them. People carted money through the streets in wheelbarrows. The cost of one loaf of bread rose to 4.6 million marks. 
In the long cold winter of 1923, people who once had savings and still had jobs broke up their furniture and shoved the pieces into the stove to keep from freezing. They used banknotes as wallpaper to cover over the cracks. Women sewed paper money into dresses. Children taped bills together to fashion kites. They shoved handfuls of the stuff into the stove where at least it bought them a few minutes of warmth. Desperate men pried copper off drain pipes to trade for food to feed their families. Gas was siphoned out of any automobile left on the street. Petty thieves stole knapsacks and suitcases but left the worthless paper money behind. In dark alleyways, counter-revolutionaries crashed with communists and with bands of state police. On a double-decker bus, a pale and sickly woman rocked herself back and forth. 600 billion, she muttered repeatedly. Seated around her, red, worn, and angry faces looked shrewdly at each other, wondering what orchestrated magic could be at play. Their savings, incredibly, had disappeared, absorbed into the ether after a lifetime of patient work. What wizardry, they wondered, could explain the strange upending? And in every mind as they watched their neighbor from the corner of their eyes, remained the question, who, who was to blame? Thank you. So I wanted to start the book there. I think very few World War II books start there with the inflation of the Weimar Republic, you know, um, before the Nazi regime would come to power, before Hitler would come to, because I think it really gives us an understanding of the situation that needed to be in place for a Hitler to come to power, right? Um, for the overthrow of a democracy. So anyway, so that's where that's where it starts. Yeah. And then we go into the sisters story just soon after that. To your awareness, did they ever have a close call? Were they almost got caught? Yeah, they had several close calls. They helped uh, one <laughs> member of the Berlin underground, and he told them afterwards that um, after the war, he, he told them that he had met with them in Berlin and that he had been tracked and that if they had if the the Nazi regime officials had realized that the sisters were working with him and to benefit him the sisters would have been taken and put into a camp immediately yeah so they did and they also had a couple close calls that they knew about like where there were people um when they, especially at border crossings officials would get suspicious but the sisters were like so good at just being really disarming. There's a scene in the novel where the, the guards are interrogating them and they offer them chocolates. <laughs> and that's just like really how they were, you know, and they would just, um, yeah. So, so they were good at, um, the, they were good at disarming people and just being like, how could you possibly suspect us? Like, you know, I mean, we're just two silly sisters. Yeah. They would very much do what a lot of um, spies, female spies in the Civil War also would do, which would use their gender to benefit them and, and all the ways that hindered them as well. But they would they would just say, oh, silly old me, like, of course not. I'm just like a silly woman. What would I know about all of the guns that are beneath my petticoat? <laughs> yeah, so they, they did yeah, that a lot. the close calls, they continued. Mm -hmm. They never said, oh, that was close. We need to back off. Yeah. That, that's remarkable. Yeah, it is. And the thing is, no one knew when the war, like it was really clear that Germany and England were going to go to war, right? But nobody knew when it was going to happen. And if they had gotten stuck over there when when that, you know, war happened, like when it, when it broke out, they would have been in huge trouble. And they knew that, like they knew they would get stuck behind those closed borders and wouldn't be able to get out. So it was a countdown, like how close can we make, you know, keep this? So, and they, they really, they aided a Polish um, boy on the very last ship out of Poland. So the very last ship they had a, a, one of their cases, he was he was on there. He arrived after the war had broken out, but it set sail before. So I mean, talk about down to the wire and they had been there only a couple weeks before. So it was very close. Yeah, and I don't know, they just, um, they had like kind of an unfeeling <laughs> faith in humanity, but I, who knows why, you know, like <laughs> considering what they, 
but yeah, they just, they just, Ida especially just, she felt like it would work out and it did. <laughs> so funny thing about optimism is a lot of times it ends up, you know, being right. So, yeah. My guess is if it's so, say 26. Yeah, they did. No, many of them had children. Yeah, like Elsa, Elsa, Elsa had children. Yeah, no, she, they did save many more. Yeah, and it's interesting because it was the 29, but also those were 29 cases. So it seems there may be some evidence that some of those 29 may have been families. We're not sure. Even Isabel Vincent couldn't figure it out entirely. So yeah, it's about 29, but yeah, but they attempted to help hundreds. And and it was just like the and actually, I mean, Ida was not just an idealist because the weight of it after the war began was so hard on her because she's so they became really attached to these people and they worked so hard to get them out and then they couldn't get any word you know from many of them they had no idea what was happening to these people behind the border at that point so yeah it definitely took a, a very big toll on Ida particularly her, her mental health during the war other questions yes yeah. so when they help people when they help smuggle people out of Europe yeah um were these people that in underground and identified as being maybe candidates or or people who needed help or I mean were these all were these cases all prearranged? So what mostly happened is Clemens Krauss, who was the conductor, and he was married to the opera singer Bjorka Ursula. They are way high up in the Nazi like echelon like so he's Hitler's favorite conductor so they are secretly working to undermine mm -hmm. Hitler's regime so they become really good friends with the sisters mm -hmm. and they ask the sisters if they could please help their friends um the uh Elsa's mother Mitya Meyer Lissman and she becomes the first one so she, they're from um Frankfurt and so Mitya introduces, after, after the sisters help Mitya's family get out, then Mitya says, I have all these friends who also need help. <laughs> so the sisters will travel and they'll stay with Mitya's family at first. And then once their family's gone, they'll stay with friends and they'll conduct these interviews. So these people will come in and many of them don't speak English. So Louise learns German so that she can wow. conduct these interviews. I know they're both just, <laughs> amazing what the extent of what they did you know the two of them so they're conducting these interviews in both german and in english and they're trying to figure out um what the best way is because they become really good familiar they learn all about the system like they learn all about the british immigration system and what is allowed and what is not allowed so a lot of what they're doing is problem solving you know they get really good at listening to these stories and say maybe you should try this, have you tried this, you know, and kind of creatively. And then a lot of times they'll, they'll start down one path, like trying to get one kind of visa and then it won't work, they'll hit a dead end. So then they'll have to pivot and try a different route, right? Like, can they get them a job offer? Can they get them, you know, so th there's a lottery system to America. Um, so can they get them there, you know, and any one of these like multiple routes that they could work out. So, and sometimes they conduct these interviews and just, determine like I, I can't think of any way to help this person you know that's still you can imagine the emotional weight of that right like they're aware that these people are people <laughs> yeah and they're listening to these stories day after day after day and it's just heartbreaking like it's just heartbreaking so and they know they know they're only going to be able to help a small small percentage of them yeah whatever did the conductor Clemens Krauss. Yeah. He did. So yeah, so he um, stood trial at Nuremberg, actually, just because he did a good job pretending to be a Nazi, which he was, a Nazi, you know, I mean, he never officially joined the party. So but he benefited a lot. And he worked closely with Hitler and the whole regime. And so afterwards, there were a lot of people who were really upset and said that his career had been way too benefited by the work he had done with the Nazi regime. But he was able to show like look what i was doing on the side you know at nuremberg so he was exonerated and and a big part of that exoneration was because of the work he had done with the cook sisters so yeah other questions uh, 
Nice job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> Well, I would love to sign some books. I do have fairy books too. Um, and I think you can check these ones out at the library, right? Yes. Yeah. And if you have other questions, feel free to come talk to me. I'd love to meet you. Thanks for being here. Yep, women.